On this episode of Omnivore, how much do consumers really care about food sustainability, working safely with plant-based proteins, and assessing the shortcomings and strengths of Nova Food classification? It's all ahead on episode 17 of Omnivore, from the editors of Food Technology Magazine and the Institute of Food Technologists. This episode of Omnivore has been sponsored by IFT's new Product Development Bootcamp, a comprehensive 10-module online course designed to equip food and beverage professionals with the knowledge and skills necessary to elevate and accelerate product development. Learn more at ift.org slash bootcamp. Welcome to Omnivore from IFT and Food Technology, where we explore the intersection of business science, and technology in the global food system. I'm Bill McDowell. Consumers are complicated. After two decades at the helm of behavioral research firm Insights Now, Dave Lundahl knows that better than most. Insights Now has done in-depth research into the impact of sustainability on consumers' purchasing patterns. That research makes it clear that how consumers feel about sustainability doesn't always translate directly to what they put in their shopping carts. So just how much does sustainable product positioning matter? And how should food and beverage marketers be going about it? Dr. Lundahl offers his perspective in this interview with Food Technologies' Mary Ellen Kuhn. Dave, I know from some of our earlier conversations that your research shows that there's a sizable segment of consumers who want to buy products that have clear sustainability benefits. So let's talk about that. Who are the consumers that are most interested in a product sustainability benefits? And does that break up by age or some other demographic segment? In August of last year, we did some work on U.S. primary shoppers, as the shoppers that will our primary household buyers for their and um, what we found amongst these is that uh, U.S. shoppers are a lot of about half are very aspirational to buy products okay that are sustainable but only about 15 percent are actually doing so and that means you know by the math 30 35 percent are aspirational or buy are not buying sustainable products. And we found some different barriers. One barrier is just it's not sustainable products are not available. Uh, There's confusion in other cases of what is a sustainable product. In some cases, it's concerns about the product's performance. You know, is it going to taste good? Is it going to be convenient? And in many cases, it's about affordability. So among the 15%, these people are mixed in age. You know, they'll trade away anything for sustainability. The other quarter, a percent, 20, actually 24% by our work. And these people are pretty much confused about what is sustainable. And uh, these people tend to be skewed younger. And then there's another 8%. Uh, and these are also younger, but also lower income individuals that just can't afford to trade up. But they're They would love to if they could. They just can't afford the price points. Well, switching gears a little bit, I read an article last week, and it posited that senior management and companies across the board were talking less about the impact of ESG goals on their organizations. Mm -hmm. It really brought to mind that term that I learned from you in one of our conversations, green hushing. So could you talk a little bit about food brands and the issue of green hushing? What is it and how worried should food companies be about it? So this reference that you made, you know, senior management and food companies seem to be talking less about ESG and sustainability now than maybe 18 months ago or whatever. I think a lot of this is kind of a symptom of the short-sightedness that a lot of senior managers have had to take in the food industry. I mean, certainly, you know, the financial aspects, you know, from high inflation and how that's impacting their businesses as well as as consumers is paramount. And, uh, you know, that that is a key thing. So it is forced, I think, a lot of senior managers to, 
be very focused on now and the things that are going to impact the bottom line this quarter or next quarter and into the next year. So it's really difficult to think through things longer term. And I think that's part of the issue here because this idea of sustainability is a longer term issue and it's a longer term trend with consumers as well. So by focusing on that, I, I think it's, it, you know, there's an, the senior managers need to try to look at when they think about ESG or sustainability, a little longer term view. Now, when it comes to green hushing, that's an interesting thing because it is this sort of, a, d- define it, what is it? it? It is this sort of holding back uh, marketers um, in terms of being concerned that they're going to get called out for greenwashing. And so that some watchdogs are going to call them out and uh, really create some issues for their brands and upset their marketing plans. I think also, you know, this sort of short sightedness in the industry is something that um, that that marketers need to take also a little bit longer term view. I think this idea of green hushing is a symptom, again, of not reading the tea leaves right and may perhaps look needing to look at what are these trends that are going to be enduring, you know. Uh, so so uh, I, I think green hushing is going to become less and less. Now, the other thing we saw is that uh, at the Natural Products Expo is a, a, a larger sort of use of certifications that are used to um, validate various claims that are being made around uh, sustainability, both on package as well as in the product itself and, and um, the supply chains that companies use. And what we saw is a larger number of certifications, some certifications I've never seen before that are hitting the market. I think that's going to help in the long run to help alleviate a lot of these green hushing concerns amongst marketers, because there'll be something that uh, shoppers are going to look for as a way to validate that these claims are not just a bunch of green washing. So I guess it's a process. Yep, I think it's a process. So uh, I would, you know, I, I think this is going to get worked out long term. And, uh, you know, we're still in the early stages of a shift in a lot of the food product development towards a more sustainable future. Well, I want to ask you about something that I know you think is important to the future of food, the idea of resiliency. What exactly Mm. does that mean in terms of food companies and food brands, and why is it so important? Right. Yeah, resilience is more about having the capacity or perhaps the ability to adapt to climate change. And I think that you can look at resiliency with regard to businesses, And you can look at resiliency regarding food systems. And they all are intertwined, of course, because there's a lot of um, elements of sustainability uh, that are impacting businesses from the agricultural side. You know, for instance, uh, companies could look to, as a part of resiliency, to having different um, and more drought tolerant crops that they use or having food systems that are more resilient, like your supply chains, uh, making sure you have alternative suppliers uh, that you can utilize and so on, uh, reducing food waste, uh, manufacturing resiliencies, you know, low low water or low energy use, uh, or packaging that uses less plastic. And I think that you could also think about resiliency in terms of consumers and how consumers are, you know, changing, and how do you respond to that consumer change? So I really liked your article that you had in May, the May issue of Food Technology, where you highlighted a number of companies. I think you and I talked about this uh, last time we chatted, a number of companies that are able to um, create a business plan that is able to not only drive some success and so as a for-profit company, but also being able to do it in ways that reduces carbon 
gases that are uh, causing changes to climate. So I think that's a really important element. And one of the companies that you highlighted was Neutral Foods. And they're going right to these dairy farmers and providing services to help them be more climate smart. And I'm seeing more and more of this use of this word climate smart that is being used as a way to achieve resiliency. So we could be headed towards a whole brave new world of of products that are factoring in things like being climate smart. Yeah, I think that's exactly. Um, And I think smaller companies as well as larger companies can also be climate smart in different ways. Well, this is a great conversation and I really appreciate you taking the time to share your insights, Dave. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. My pleasure. Dave Lundahl is founder and CEO of behavioral research firm Insights Now. Learn more about his approach sifting through the ins and outs of consumer behavior and what it means for product developers in the August issue of Food Technology. We'll be back with more Omnivore in a moment, but first, this word from our sponsor. Introducing IFT's Product Development Bootcamp, a comprehensive 10-module online course designed to equip food and beverage professionals with the knowledge and skills necessary to elevate and accelerate product development. Whether you're new to product development or need a refresh on the basics, IFT's Product Development Bootcamp offers a wealth of valuable insights, practical strategies, and real-world examples to take your product development to the next level. Learn more at ift.org slash bootcamp. Welcome back to Omnivore. I'm Bill McDowell. With the world population estimated to reach 10 billion by 2050, the push to produce sustainable and nutritious alternative proteins is reshaping the food industry, with companies investing heavily to develop a variety of alternative, plant-based protein products. Food technology contributor and microbiologist Erdwan Jalen says product developers have multiple options when innovating plant-based products. But a common question is, how safe are they? Do they carry the same food safety risks as conventional protein ingredients? In fact, he says plant-based ingredients do have differences in allergens and microorganisms that could impact toxin production and finished products. Food Technologies' Julie Larson Brisher talked with Dr. Jalen about potential food safety risks and quality concerns product developers need to consider when formulating plant-based products. Hi, Erdogan. It's a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Hi, Julie. Thank you for inviting me. Well, you know, I wanted to talk to you today about the myths that can be busted around plant-based ingredient and food safety. Are there any myths to be busted when it comes to ingredient safety and plant-based proteins? I'm thinking about are plant-based proteins safer than conventional protein ingredients, for example? That's a very good question, Julie. It would be misleading if we said plant-based proteins are safe or even safer than conventional proteins. Maybe we can approach this question from two different angles microbiological hazards or uh, chemical hazards, specifically uh, allergens will be a good example for that. First of all, plant-based proteins come from agricultural crops. And these crops can be contaminated in the field with a wide range of microorganisms from the soil. And later they can be uh, also contaminated during handling, storage, transportation, or manufacturing. So um, also the production of uh, plant-based proteins is a multi-stage process. You know, processing can inactivate most foodborne pathogens that originate from raw ingredients. However, uh, there's something that it's overlooked. There are many heat-resistant pathogens that might come from the soil, and they can survive typical uh, thermal process. Um, 
Nowadays, we have a huge selection of plant proteins, including plant powders. Consumers may think that low moisture protein powders are inherently safe. However, this is not necessarily true. Bacterial pathogens can survive under low moisture conditions for an extended period of time. So uh, this is basically summarized the uh, microbiological aspect of plant proteins. So they are not free of uh, microorganisms. When we look at the potential chemical hazards uh, associated with plant proteins, chemical hazards, perhaps allergens, pose the highest risk. Uh, most plant-based protein substitutes contain at least one major food allergen, such as soy and wheat, and they are very highly concentrated. Um, as processed foods, plant-based substitutes may contain many other ingredients uh, with various uh, allergens. As a result, consumers may consume much higher doses of allergens and multiple allergens uh, at the same time. Let's dive into that a little bit deeper. Like, what, what are some of the specific micro hazards, you know, when you're formulating with plant-based proteins? Yeah, um, several challenges are associated with the uh, microbiological risk of plant proteins. As mentioned uh, earlier, uh, when we look at the microbiological hazards, we need to start with the soil. You know, there are some uh, microorganisms from the soil that are not commonly found in animal-based meats. Uh, and these microorganisms can be carried over to finished products. Second, uh, we need to define other microbiological hazards that can be introduced to the product. And these will be typical microorganisms that cause post-process contamination in any food processing facility. And also, when we look at uh, plant-based proteins, we can perhaps divide them into two major categories. Uh, one will be high moisture uh, product group, the other one will be low moisture powder products. And I think we need to uh, look at them separately in terms of uh, their safety aspects. Um, if you look at the uh, high moisture plant proteins, we know that they have high moisture and they have a high amount of protein naturally and a near neutral pH or acidity. And this makes them very susceptible to microbiological growth and eventually toxin production if there's any microorganism that can produce toxin. Like any other food products, foodborne pathogens, uh, such as salmonella, E. coli, dysteria, may be introduced into these products as well because of contaminated ingredients or if they are processed in a poor hygienic processing facility. Therefore, we suggest that, like animal meats, plant-based products such as sausages and burgers should be cooked to a minimum of 160 degree internal temperature before consumption. In addition to that, heat-resistant pathogens, namely Clostridia and Bacilli, can survive all these high uh, treatments, and especially in uh, high moisture products. And if they are vacuum packaged, Clostridia can easily grow and produce toxin. Therefore, temperature control becomes very, very critical for this type of products. And the second category will be the uh, uh, powdered products. The scenario is a little different for powdered products because like high moisture products, they are also susceptible to contamination from a wide range of microorganisms. Although microorganisms cannot grow in uh, powders due to low moisture, they can survive for months, even years. And low infective dose pathogens such as salmonella and listeria can easily pose a health risk at low numbers. Therefore, these pathogens must not be present in the products at any level prior to consumption. As you know, if you look at the news, we have many examples of outbreaks 
associated with these pathogens in low moisture products. So earlier, Erdogan, you talked about um, other risks in addition to the microbiological ones uh, for these plant-based proteins. So what what would you say are some of the other food safety watchouts or considerations you'd like to share with product developers in terms of other hazards to watch out for? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, plant proteins are so-called ultra processed products, right? They have they go through many many stages. And they may contain uh, many ingredients as well in the in the final form. So these ingredients are added to achieve meat-like attributes and some others added to increase the nutritional quality. But these ingredients come with a price. So if we talk about allergens in the U.S., uh, nine major food allergens are listed on the label. However, over 160 foods have been identified as potential food allergens for sensitive individuals. And if we just quickly take a look at how these uh, plant-based protein substitutes are made, we know that they contain highly concentrated uh, plant proteins, such as 90% soy protein uh, isolate. Uh, In addition to that uh, major protein, the addition of other ingredients may introduce new allergens that are not commonly found in animal-based meats. This means that they might contain higher doses of allergens and multiple sources of potential allergens if they are consumed. And it is uh, recommended that consumers with known uh, with known allergies read the ingredient list really carefully and make sure that uh, they are aware of uh, the source of uh, the plant proteins. And in addition to that, some plant-based substitutes may contain relatively high amounts of salts and saturated fat. And as you know, elevated levels of these ingredients in the diet can increase the risk of high blood pressure and cardiovascular disease. The other phenomena that uh, we uh, often uh, talk about is the gut microbiome. If you look at the uh, plant-based diet alone, it appears to promote the development of healthy gut microbiomes. However, if we look at the plant-based protein substitutes, uh, it's difficult to say the same thing because they may affect gut microbiomes because plant proteins are highly processed, and they lack some of the beneficial nutritional components found in the natural form. Also, the presence of anti-nutrients and some of the functional functional ingredients may cause uh, gastrointestinal inflammation, and they might alter gut function. So um, researchers show that Occasional replacement of animal meat with plant-based proteins doesn't really cause any negative changes in the gut, uh, gut microbiome. But I think we need uh, more research studies uh, to understand the long-term effects of uh, consuming plant-based meat substitutes. Thanks, Erdwan, for busting some of those myths and giving us some useful watchouts today. I hope that we'll be able to see each other again. Absolutely. It has been a great pleasure, Julie, and thank you for having me again. Erdwan Jalen is Director of Scientific Affairs with Maria Nutrisciences and Chair of IFT's Refrigerated and Frozen Foods Division. You can read more about food safety and quality of plant-based ingredients in the August issue of Food Technology. Nova Food Classification System ascribes the healthfulness of food products to the degree they've been processed beyond their raw state. Nova has been controversial since it was first introduced in 2009 by nutrition researcher Carlos Montero and his colleagues at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. In this month's dialogue essay, University of Minnesota's Job Ubink 
and Alan Levine say the debate over Nova focuses too much on processing and not enough on formulation. I recently caught up with the longtime colleagues to hear more about their perspective. I know that we're here to talk about Nova and your upcoming dialogue essay, but before we do, I would love to hear a little bit about the origin story of your collaboration. I know that both of you come from different academic backgrounds. Tell me a little bit about how this this collaboration came to be and, and your work together on this topic. It's actually Al who took the lead, but uh, and actually sent an email to me last year talking about actually food processing and the impact of these classification schemes. And that immediately arose my interest. And actually Al's emails was, was written in a way from we need someone who knows food processing to whatever to at least discuss. So, and actually this really resonated with me because I run into NOVA, I think it was around 2011 or 12, when I started preparing for teaching at the ETH in Zurich in food technology, where I already looped it into, into the curriculum at the time. So there they started and both Al and me, and I think I'll, I'll let Al as well say, but I think we, we feel there's something in NOVA, but it didn't quite line up. So, so there our conversation started. Yeah, and you know, my background is, how the brain regulates food intake. So I'm a specialist in obesity research. And in the area, my colleagues are constantly writing about ultra processed foods. And I felt they didn't know much about it at all. And so the health sciences, people in the health sciences are not often educated in food technology. So I contacted Yoga and we thought this would be a good collaboration. This is such a hot button issue. There are a lot of people in the food community that have an almost visceral reaction to Nova. Yo, but I'd like to perhaps start with you just by asking you to offer your assessment of Nova's strengths and weaknesses, because it seems that your perspective is perhaps a bit more nuanced than what we typically hear when, when this topic is being discussed within the food science community. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I must say, Nova, in my opinion, brings a lot of good things to the table, but it misses out on also a couple of crucial things as they impact uh, the uh, industrially processed foods and the impact of food on health. Uh, what I very much appreciate in Nova is that it is a holistic concept of how food fits within a diet and how it actually helps people to stay either healthy or, or support them in their life and also in their appreciation of food. What I miss in Nova is it actually puts essentially the uh, the, the, um, the negative sides of some of uh, of the foods we take into exclusively the processing side. So I value the holistic integral vision on foods and that are things going on with foods that may be not good for us. But I really I, I dislike that uh, that that focus on exclusively on um, uh, processing as being the culprit. Yeah, and I I felt that. The meaning food processing without understanding the discussion around it in the health sciences was not the way to go. And it's a, for me, it's a tremendous oversimplification because foods are very complex. And I had done some early research on taking apart foods and putting them back together and looking at nutrient absorption. And you can change things through processing. So what I'm hearing from you, though, is that while Nova has some flaws in terms of its structure or its execution, you do see some utility to it as a, a framing mechanism. Is that a, a fair assessment? What NOVA essentially uh, points at is as many of the foods and the way people can acquire them also at the price point and accessibility, actually they're, they're not part of a healthy diet. I think that, that's an important a uh, positive aspect of NOVA that it really focuses on that situation and our food excess and our food consumption. Uh, what I really dislike is that it, it actually then says there's one factor while there are very many factors, as Al mentioned. There are very many factors which impact the healthfulness of, of a food, how people come to choose a food, why they eat it, uh, how much they can pay for it, and that's all ignored. And, and that's, uh, I think, one of the big deficiencies in NOVA. If you take a look at what's been happening in the daily newspaper, 
they're not talking about the four categories. They're talking about ultra processed mm -hmm. only. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I meant by an oversimplification because they go to either extreme, either unprocessed or highly processed. There's a lot in between that goes on with that. And there's health values. There's foods that are good for you and not so good for you as most people define it in both categories. And Alan, there are a lot of competing ideas floating around about the impact of processing or ultra processing on nutrition that go beyond just the question of craveability. I, I'm based on your background. What's your assessment of the link between processing and nutrition? Well, one of the things that people are worried about is overconsumption because of the obesity epidemic. So you make foods highly palatable. And, you know, we've asked the food industry to make our foods safe, cheap, and taste good, right? So <laughs> they made they did a very good job of making it taste good. And so the overconsumption is a characteristic that most people are concerned with, and there are daily discussions around that. But the other point is that some of the foods that are in there are very high in sodium, high in sugar, and Getting into the extremes on those is not a, a recommendation that most nutritionists or health or physicians would make. So I think that's where the discussion winds up is in that category. And the other thing is some people are starting to focus on food additives. They're starting to say those substances that are added not only make it palatable, but they're not, they could cause cancer and other things. And there's very limited data on that. Is the focus on processing or the degree of processing almost becoming a distraction around a bigger discussion around formulation? It seemed to be that that was a, a central tenet of your essay, that, that we really should be having a deeper discussion about, you know, what's actually going into these processed foods. I think you're right there. Processing definitely has, it can have a positive or negative aspect on the nutritional quality of foods and ingredients. Uh, but it's, uh, it, it, the processing is now, essentially if you say something is processed, it's synonymous with it's bad for you. And, and there, you know, I totally disagree. It's really, as you say, it's largely the formulation which de determines if a food fits in a healthy diet or, or not, uh, rather than overall putting everything together on the on the processing. Yeah, and I don't think people are distinguishing that whole characteristic of the ultra-processed. They use the word ultra-processed, but it's ultra-formulated. So you have to discuss the recipe as well as the process by which the recipe is made. But there's no, if you take a look at the daily media, when they say ultra-processed, they mean to include the formulation as well. They're not distinguishing it. Do you see any progress in the dialogue between the food science community and the health and nutrition community? And what needs to be done to make this better? I, I think it needs to, if you want to have a dialogue, it needs to come from both sides. And if you want to actually be able to come from your both sides, you need to have at least some kind of basic understanding of what happens on the other side. So what Al already mentioned, uh, nutritional insights have progress, but they do so very slowly because, you know, one study is a basically no study. You need to really accumulate evidence of certain components, ingredients, uh, foods in your diet over decades to see if they have, you know, what type of impact they have. Food industry operates way quicker. So I think there is a disconnect there. So I think there should be the appreciation of how nutrition research and medical research progress versus how the food industry can develop and launch products. Uh, also there, very often medical researchers, they announce a finding, say, well, wow, we have something here, or at least that's brought out in the in the press as this is really important, even though those may be only a building block, maybe an important building block, but one of the building blocks you need to put in place. On the other hand, it's also that lack of understanding of processing is really making that conversation very difficult also with the food science community. And what you see is that everything is heaped together yeah, I, I would also comment, there's sort of a political nature to this as well. So one of the things that happens is the people in the health science community see the people in the nutrition and food science community defending the food industry. And they're saying, look, these guys are making a ton of money on all this special food they make that makes us overconsume. 
And so they immediately are negative about it. We definitely have to look at uh, the future of our food systems and, and we need to engage also in the industry in a different manner. Uh, we should also really put that essentially that the well-being over food also very central in our, in our, in our reflections in, in how we develop uh, products. Uh, but this should be really a, a, a process in which all the sides engage. And I think there are a lot of opportunities to also recognize the importance of processing for 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 our food system, for our health, for 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 for, for, for our whole society, and actually creating that uh, affordable and safe and appealing food for everyone. Job Ubink is head of the Department of Food Science and Nutrition at the University of Minnesota and a member of IFT's Food Chemistry Division. Alan Levine is a past vice president of research at Minnesota and Professor Emeritus of Food Science and Nutrition. You can read their dialogue essay about NOVA's strengths and shortcomings in the August issue of Food Technology. This episode of Omnivore is brought to you by IFT's new Product Development Bootcamp, a comprehensive 10-module online course designed to equip food and beverage professionals with the knowledge and skills necessary to elevate and accelerate product development. Learn more at ift.org bootcamp. And that wraps up this episode of Omnivore. Thanks again to all our guests and my colleagues at Food Technology. Omnivore is produced and distributed by the Institute of Food Technologists. If you enjoyed today's show and want to learn more about Food Technology Magazine or how to join the conversation by becoming an IFT member, visit ift.org membership. For more in-depth discussion about innovation in the science of food, check out IFT's other podcast, SciDish, on the news and publications page of ift.org. If you have comments or suggestions for future shows, just send us an email. The address is editors at ift.org. For the entire team at Food Technology and IFT, I'm Bill McDowell. Thanks for listening, and join us again for our next episode. This is Omnivore.